Hey guys, Dave Kelly here with Market Misbehavior. Uh, one of the biggest challenges I think investors face is what's called the endowment bias, which is the tendency to hold on to trades that aren't working just because it's something that we own. We have an emotional attachment to our current holdings, and when the chart tells us to do one thing, we tend to not listen to what the chart is telling us. Today, we'll talk about what endowment effect really means, how it impacts your trading. We'll look at some examples of how we can invert the price scale and also use some inverse ETFs to try to disconnect ourselves from the negative effects of the endowment bias. So I've spent a lot of my career talking about behavioral biases, sort of those things, those categorical uh, explanations of why we behave in certain ways. And I'm fascinated by how we're hardwired to make poor decisions a lot of times with our, with our money, particularly with our investment portfolio. Today, we're going to talk about the endowment bias or the endowment effect, which is essentially an emotional attachment that we have to a particular thing. One of the examples I share with people is uh, like a coffee cup, right? I have a coffee cup that I got from a music conference that I attended four years ago, five years ago, I want to say. Um, and that coffee cup has an incredible amount of meaning to me because the moment I look at that logo, the moment I pick it up, I have all these great memories of that event, of that experience, of the people I met. Uh, and, uh, and so it, it, it ended up having a very emotional attachment to that coffee cup. Now, for you, it might just be another coffee cup, right? If you saw it in a coffee shop, you'd think, oh, it's just as good of it as anything else. It's sort of a commodity, right? It's the same as anything else. But for me, I have a particular emotional attachment because of, uh, because of what the, the cup means to me. Now, here's the thing. Uh, we do the same sort of uh, discussion with ourselves, with our investment portfolios. Let's say you own a stock, the FANG stocks, for example. You own them through the course of 2021. They did very well for you. All of a sudden, 2022 starts to look a little different. However, even though the chart tells you things are getting worse, even though the interest rate environment tells you growth stocks are probably going to struggle, you still hold on because you believe you have this emotional connection, connection to that position and you almost want to will it to go higher uh, on its own. This is called the endowment effect. Uh, we're going to look at a chart here, a couple charts I think that could help you disconnect from that negative effect. It's a trick I've used with, uh, with uh, institutional investors to try to uh, help them make sense of it. Before we get to that, by the way, if you like this sort of thinking about investor decision making and behavior using technical analysis, won't you hit subscribe? That'd be great to have you along this ride. Also, give the video a like if you appreciated it. We'd very much appreciate it back. Let's get to the charts. All right, so here we're looking at the New York FANG Plus Index, which is dollar sign NYFANG on stockcharts.com. This is an index from the New York Stock Exchange that tracks the FANG stocks, uh, you know, Meta platforms, Alphabet, Amazon, um, and also others. And that's why it's called FANG Plus. It's things like, you know, Twitter, Tesla, I forget what else, maybe like Sohu or like Chinese internet names might be in there, sort of FANG and FANGY or FANG-like uh, stocks in this index. Now, if you look at the chart of the FANG Plus Index, you can see uh, the leadership, right? The uptrend in 2020, the March 2020 low is sort of off the viewable screen to the left. You have this nice consistent uh, uptrend in 2021, in the be or 2020, the beginning of 21. Then this sort of gentler uptrend made a new high into the November uh, period, but overall the pace was slowing a bit. And then look at how things change, right? In particular, at the bottom, the relative strength went from outperforming it to market performing to underperforming. And, you know, back here in November, this is when the NASDAQ made its uh, new all-time high. The S&P made a new high into a uh, year end, into the beginning of January. But a lot of technology and uh, growth stocks actually peaked out in November. This is when the Fed was talking about, talking about changing their interest rate policy. This is when there was speculation about when rate hikes would start to actually emerge and uh, not a lot of clarity in terms of how it would actually play out. Now, all of a sudden, over the last six months, we've gotten some, you know, it's become a lot more real. We've actually experienced experienced, uh, you know, rate hikes, and we have expectations of what uh, future rate hikes to expect through the course of 2022. And as a result, that sort of environment, higher rates, uh, trying to address inflationary pressures, big headwind to uh, growth stocks. And the reason is because as rates go up, the growth part of, of growth names is just less attractive because you uh, because it's uh, it's it's less opportunity above what you could get now, uh, just uh, with your with your capital currently. So growth stocks in general have rolled over. The ARK Innovation Fund and others have all sort of had a, a tough go of it in the last six months. And most importantly, the relative strength has been so negative. Now, what can you analyze from this chart? Let's say if you, you know, thinking about that endowment effect, what endowment effect causes you to do if you own these types of stocks is even though there's been a clear transition, I would argue, from uptrend phase 
to downtrend phase, right? From accumulation phase to distribution phase, we still, um, you know, the endowment effect, what it does is it, it, it causes us to still want to hold a stock or an ETF like this uh, or, or names like this because uh, because we feel a connection to it, right? We remember this period of outperformance. It's one of our core positions. We're very hesitant to admit defeat, which is acknowledging that this great thesis that we had is no longer playing out correctly. But if you look at the chart, how many clear signals could you recognize over the last year that told you that transition had happened, right? You went from making higher highs to making lower highs, making higher lows to lower lows. Instead of being above two upward sloping moving averages, as we saw in November, we're now below two downward sloping moving averages here in May of uh, 2022. The momentum, instead of being in a more bullish phase, becoming overbought as it tries to make new highs and barely getting back to the oversold region on pullbacks, we now have the whole momentum range is shifted lower. We become oversold when we sell off. We don't get above 60 on a rally. And most importantly, the fact that the relative strength has just been so consistently negative in the last six months. Some combination of that evidence should have suggested to you, if you hold some of these names, that the environment was getting less ideal and you most likely want to um, you know, protect yourself, protect your capital and, uh, and minimize your losses. Now, there obviously are a number of ETFs that can give you exposure to these stocks. And when I'm asked for like a FANG ETF, I usually just say the Qs because the Qs are a pretty good proxy. I mean, a little different because it's a different universe. It's not the exact same companies, but the mega cap stocks that dominate the FANG plus index are the same mega cap names that dominate the NASDAQ 100. So the Qs are probably a clear, you know, most, uh, you know, straight line from, uh, you know, in terms of a liquid ETF from uh, the FANG stocks to uh, to an ETF you could trade. But there also are, you know, there's an ETN called FNGS, a little less liquid and, and, and a little smaller, certainly in terms of the NASDAQ 100 trust, which is one of the most liquid uh, ETFs out there. Obviously, a lot less uh, assets under management here, but really designed to track that uh, FANG plus index, you know, ideally, right? It's, it's really meant to mirror the returns of that index. And you see all the same challenges with the trend, with the uh, momentum and with the relative strength. So two tricks to try to disconnect yourself from the endowment effect. Number one, invert the price scale. And this is a, a trick on stock charts. You can put a little minus sign or a hyphen in front of the ticker and it immediately just quickly inverts the scale. And it's just a quick little trick to change things. But what we would often see on the institutional side, if you're struggling, you have a long position that's starting to not work and you're struggling as to whether or not you want to sell it, we invert the scale and say, all right, is this a chart you would want to buy? So this inverted chart of FNGS, forget what I just said, forget what ticker it is, this chart, how does it look? Well, it's gone from a downtrend to an uptrend pretty clearly, right? It's gone from lower highs to higher highs, it's gone from lower lows to higher lows, it's gone from being below moving averages to being above moving averages. It's coming off of a new high for the last 12 months in the last week or so. Not a bad chart, just recently pulled back. Seems like a pretty decent chart uh, rotating into a period of accumulation. So if it looks like such a good long idea here, why would the opposite not be a great sell idea, right? And that's what happens when we just change our relationship with the chart. We disconnect from what the company is and what the index represents. We can analyze the, the chart more clearly. And again, these, this is just a trick. You know, ideally, as a technical analyst, as, a, as an investor using charts, you disconnect the fundamental and the macro analysis from the technical analysis, right? You don't want to cloud your analysis of the chart by thinking about all these macro themes and stuff. They should be two separate discussions that you're having with yourself. So that is one trick is just invert the chart. The other thing, and which is helpful with a lot of ETFs and uh, exchange traded products, is that you have a lot of inverse versions of that. So there's an inverse uh, ETF uh, called BERZ, and it basically is uh, designed to, to match inverse returns daily of the uh, of the FNGS ETF uh, or, or an inverse of the FANG plus ETF. So by owning this ETF, you're essentially shorting um, those uh, mega cap tech and, uh, and communications names. How does this chart look? Well, a little less history, obviously, because this, this uh, ETF actually was issued in August of last year. But overall, you can see, again, that similar pattern of making new swing highs. You can see it's, it's still holding above support, making higher lows above moving averages not bad relative performance and the momentum is overall fairly constructive remaining above 50 not a bad chart so what you can do is think about uh with a with an etf or current position that you're you're struggling with even if it's an individual equity number one invert the chart put a little minus sign in front of it but then uh, think about some of the inverse etfs a lot of times by analyzing those you can get a different take on uh, the underlying stocks. And again, do a pure analysis of this chart. Does this look like something you'd want to buy? And if so, why would you not want to sell or be short 
the other uh, ETF or stock that you were talking about. So that's it. That's a quick rundown of the endowment bias or the endowment effect, is which, which is this in, uh, emotional attachment you tend to have to stocks and the ETFs that you own, your current positions. And what this will cause you to do a lot of times is justify when something's going down, it'll justify in your brain why you should continue to hold it. I was taught by a mentor early on, um, all large losses begin as small losses. I think the game is not just finding the next you know, 10 bagger, the next thing that's gonna go up 10 times. It's minimizing your losses when you're wrong, admitting that you're wrong and minimizing the downside there, and then finding ways to remain in things that are working or scale into those even, uh, even more. That's how you tend to perform well over time and find consistent outperformance. So one of the things we talked about, two of the tricks that we talked about with uh, ETFs in particular, number one, invert the scale. So on stock charts, put the little minus sign before the ticker. That's an easy way with any stock or ETF to just flip it over very quickly and just look at the price action. What does that tell you uh, analyze it as its own sort of standalone thing and then compare that to what you analyzed with the regular uh, uh, the regular listing, the regular ticker. The other option with ETFs is look for inverse ETFs that track a similar universe. Do you get any different conclusion analyzing essentially an inverse uh, performing ETF and what can that tell you about what you should be doing with your uh, with your uh, with your current positions? You know, I've often asked people if it's not something you'd want to put new money in today, why would you keep old money in it uh, at the same time? So do that thinking with some of your current portfolio. You may find that you're still holding things you most likely should not, based on a pure technical analysis. That's it. I'm Dave Keller from Market Misbehavior. I'll talk to you again soon. Bye now.